Before the video begins, I just wanted to remind you that 76.3% of the people who watch these videos are not subscribed. So if you enjoy these really long anime analysis videos, then definitely subscribe and support the channel. The character of Orihime Inoue is the source of a lot of conflict within the Bleach community. Some fans interpret her character to be useless while others do see the value in her character. The way that I'm going to approach this analysis is through a neutral perspective and I'm going to give just my thoughts on her character. And before even beginning the video, I want to say that I don't think that her character is useless. I think that Orihime plays a specific role within the story and she succeeds at it. All the while, the portrayal of her character is consistent. She awakens her powers early on in the story and they grow stronger with each successive arc. Despite Knowing that she could always rely on Ichigo, this didn't stop her from becoming strong and independent. This reliance that she had on Ichigo never became dependence because she was always cultivating and growing her own power, so much so to the point that she was happy in the final arc that she could fight alongside Ichigo when they went to confront Yuhabak in chapter 672. If you pay attention to Orihime's character during the full rank arc, then you will know that prior to that arc, she was aware that Ichigo was burdening himself with the responsibility of protecting everybody around him. But because Ichigo no longer had his powers in the Forbring arc, she had taken up the responsibility of protecting him and ensuring that he wasn't burdened with concerning for the safety of his friends. As cruel as it may have been, this is why they didn't tell Ichigo about Tsukishima during the Forbring arc. I felt like it was her opportunity to tell Ichigo that I can protect you too, helping him to realize that he can rely on them as much as they rely on him. In this way, you can see that Ichigo and Orihime have both fought for each other, and this is why when they fight together in the final arc, it is so satisfactory. Orihime was one of the first characters that Kubo designed. She even appeared in the pine chapter for Bleach, which was published soon after Kubo's previous serialization Zombie Powder. Because she appears within chapter 0, we get a lot of hints about her character, in particular her feelings for Ichigo, which are well established even before the release of the first chapter of Bleach. So going into the story after having read the pilot chapter, you know how Orihime feels about him. This is why I'm going to mention chapter 0 later on in the video, piecing together the early concept behind Orihime's character, in hopes that we can better understand the final rendition of her character which appears within the Bleach manga. So with the introduction of over, let's begin my analysis of Orihime Inoue. Being one of the first characters introduced to us, she makes her debut appearance in chapter 2 of the manga and in episode 2 of the anime. Orihime is a teenager who is the same age as Ichigo. They are even taught in the same class in school. You'll notice that similar to the protagonist, she has orange hair. She also wears two sky blue coloured hairpins. We later find out that these hairpins are integral for the powers that Orihime develops later on. Orihime's appearance changes throughout the course of the story as she matures. Most notably, she goes through several different hairstyles, and thankfully she is one of the characters that we see in the final chapter, helping us to understand just how far she has come from her appearance alone. One thing to note in chapter 686 is that she is still wearing her hairpins. We learn more about these hairpins through the backstory of Orihime's character, which I will go into after we discuss some points about her personality. Orihime is very friendly and caring. She has an active imagination which leads to her having a strange sense of humour. Her optimistic attitude gives her a lot of inner motivation, which helps to drive her character throughout the lows that she experiences within the story. Orihime lives alone after having lost to her parents and her brother at a young age. This results in her being very independent. In chapter 35, we see that she is also very academic, despite how clueless she sometimes comes across as. She is ranked within the top three students of her class year, having performed exceptionally well in her first semester final exams. Orihime has a strong connection to our protagonist Ichigo. She is very perceptive to his emotional and mental state, resulting in her being one of the first people to notice if Ichigo's mood is off or if something is bothering him. Orihime has always had feelings for Ichigo which explains why she was always flustered whenever Ichigo would approach her or speak to her at the beginning of the series. In chapter 237, when Ukiara gives her the option to only say goodbye to one person before leaving with her, she decides to go and visit Ichigo. During this farewell, she confesses that her feelings have developed into something a lot stronger, as she confesses that she has fallen in love with him. Her connection with Ichigo leads her to recognize his scent from far distances, which is demonstrated in chapter 14. Her attachment and sensitivity to Ichigo's feelings is emphasized with in chapter 462. Even while being manipulated by Tsukushima, she is still devastated after seeing Ichigo crying. Tsukushima manipulates her into having feelings for him, but despite this, she is saddened after seeing Ichigo crying. This sight made her feel a deep sense of pain. Despite being manipulated to turn against Ichigo, she was relieved after seeing Ichigo in his forbing attire, no longer crying. Even after her memories were altered, her feelings for Ichigo did not disappear, and this shows just how strong the bond is between the two of them. Before we go into the history of Orihime's character, which is explained 
explained within the Bleach manga, let's talk about her appearance within the pilot chapter. The pilot chapter, also known as a one-shot, was created by Taite Kubo to see if there was any interest in the Bleach series prior to it being serialized. Because of the pilot chapter being well received, it led to the weekly serialization of Bleach. This pilot chapter reveals the early concept designs of the series that we would all come to grow and love. This one-shot does have some similarities to the early chapters of Bleach, but there are some notable differences, like how Rukia shrinks in size after giving her powers to Ichigo, or how Hollows don't wear masks. The most notable change from the pilot chapter to the series is that Orihime dies within the pilot chapter. The story revolves around Ichigo gaining Shinigami powers, and is alerted to the death of one of his classmates who is revealed to be Orihime. Orihime's backstory slightly differs here. Instead of her brother having died, it is her father. Rukia identifies that Orihime's father has become a Hollow, and it is revealed that he has killed her by pushing her down a flight of stairs. He does so so that Orihime could stay with him forever. Similar to how her backstory is told within the early chapters of Bleach, Orihime had forgotten to pray for her father, after growing older and making new friends. This pilot chapter hints at the connection between Ichigo and Orihime. There are even comical mentions of the feelings that they may or may not have for each other. When Ichigo first sees her as a Shinigami, a small-sized Rukia pretends to be Ichigo, as she tries to embarrass him by professing his undying love for Orihime. At the end of the pilot chapter, Orihime assists Ichigo in order to defeat her father. She tries to play off her feelings for Ichigo by saying that she likes him as a classmate. They both agree that if Orihime were to return as a human again, and if they were to meet, then they would love to talk to each other again. She heads off to the Soul Society and the pilot chapter ends. Now that we know the early concept of a character, let's now cover the backstory that is told within the actual manga. In chapter 6, we learn that Orihime was born when her older brother was 15 years old, yet treated her more like a daughter than a sister. This was because Orihime's parents were abusive. In chapter 6, we learn that her parents were such monsters that they would silence the cries of a baby with beatings. When Orihime was three years old, her brother had taken her and fled from their parents' home. He was afraid that if he didn't, her parents would have eventually killed her through neglect. Similar to Ichigo, she was bullied in school because of her orange hair color. In chapter 6, we learned that Orihime's older brother had gifted her with a pair of hairpins, but she never really liked them. She had gotten into an argument with her brother over these hairpins. Orihime didn't speak to him the entire night. The next morning, he had left to go to work. However, he had died on his way to work, not returning to Orihime. Ever since the death of her brother, Orihime had prayed for him daily. She had even started to wear the hairpins that were gifted to her that she initially had disliked. But a year after he had died, Orihime had made friends with Tatsuki. As her life was moving on, she had started to pray for her brother less and less. Once she had enrolled into high school and had met Ichigo and developed feelings for him, she stopped praying for her brother entirely. Ichigo had started to preoccupy her mind before she left school and after she had returned from school. In her mind, she wanted to demonstrate to her brother that she has moved on and that she is happier now, no longer mourning his loss. The brother who had always protected her no longer needed to worry about her. In chapter 450, we learned that after the death of Orihime's brother, she was financially supported by a distant relative. She had taken care of Orihime's living expenses, so long as she continues to maintain her grades in school. This now leads us to Orihime's first appearance within the manga in chapter 2. A first impression of her is while she sat in school daydreaming. Tatsuki snaps her out of her daydreaming and teases her about her fascination with Ichigo. She wonders what's so special about him, and Orihime states that it's because he is funny. Drawing parallels to the pilot chapter, Orihime is almost killed in chapter 3, where she narrowly avoids being hit by a car. Orihime later approaches Ichigo and Rukia, and we learn that she has a very quirky personality. She tells them that she is going to prepare dinner by putting together ingredients that don't sound like they'd go well together. Her unappetizing dinner aside, Ichigo notices that Orihime has been injured. She states that she was run over by a car the night before. Apparently, this has been a regular occurrence. But Rukia suspects that there is something more to Orihime's injuries after observing the markings on her leg. That same night, Orihime invites Tatsuki over as she reveals more about her feelings for Ichigo. While Tatsuki gives her advice on how to win over Ichigo's heart, her teddy bear falls on the floor. Upon a closer inspection, the stuffed animal seems to have a tear across its face, which is seeping blood. Orihime and Tatsuki are then attacked by the hollow acid wire, who ends up removing Orihime's soul from her body. During this version of events, her chain of fate is still attached to her body, so she doesn't immediately die like in the pilot chapter. She is then forced to watch the hollow attack Tatsuki, as she is left confused, wondering why she can see herself on the floor. One thing to note here, before Ichigo arrives, Orihime attempts to protect Tatsuki, telling her to run for her life. But Tatsuki cannot hear or see Orihime or the hollow. When Acid Wire is about to attack Orihime, Ichigo arrives just in time to protect her. And it is in Chapter 5 that Orihime first sees Ichigo in his Shinigami attire. Ichigo is confused as to why there are two Orihimes, and how on earth she can see him. This is when Acid Wire reveals to Ichigo that this is because Orihime has already died. After a brief encounter with Ichigo, Acid Wire 
reveals to Orihime that he is indeed her older brother. Rukia reminds Ichigo that if he doesn't stop the Hollow soon, then it's going to devour Orihime's soul. After learning the identity of the Hollow, Orihime is confused as to why he hurt Tatsuki and Ichigo. He reveals that it's because both of them had tried to take Orihime away from him. Similar to the pilot chapter, Orihime used to pray for her brother every day. That is until she had made friends with Tatsuki. She had started praying for her brother less. Then after she had entered high school, she had met Ichigo and stopped praying for her brother altogether. He was frustrated that when she would come back from school, she would only talk about Ichigo. He began to realize that he was fading from Orihime's heart with each passing day. Orihime is conflicted, wondering if her brother felt this way. Then he could have spoken to her instead of hurting her friends. The brother that she knew while he was alive would have never done anything like this. This statement angers Asidwaya as he grabs onto Orihime, but she is protected by Ichigo. While the Hollow and Ichigo battle, Orihime gets in between the two of them. She is bitten by Asidwaya, but she embraces the Hollow. She apologizes to her brother, explaining how she tried to remain happy, because at first all she did was pray, but she felt that this was the wrong thing to do. She didn't want her brother to look back and see Orihime upset that she is missing him, to see the pain that she was feeling after losing him, so she decided to hide it from him. She spoke to him about all of the things that made her happy, so that he wouldn't feel upset about leaving Orihime on her own. Orihime apologizes because she didn't know that this had made him feel lonely. Her heartfelt apology leads to her brother breaking the hollow mask and feeling remorseful for his actions. Ichigo reminds him of the hairpin that he had gifted to her, and how Orihime wears it every day because it was the first gift that he had ever given to her. He realizes that he was so caught up with his own feelings of loneliness that he didn't consider how Orihime would have been feeling, how much pain or loneliness that she must have been feeling after losing her brother. In a moment of sanity, her brother says farewell to Orihime and requests for Ichigo to send him to the Soul Society. At the end of this encounter, Rukia erases Orihime's memories, similar to how she had wiped the memories of Ichigo's sisters when his family was attacked by the Hollow Fishbone D. But despite her memories being erased, because of her encounters with the Hollows and the fact that she spends a lot of time with Ichigo, it leads to her having an increased sense of spiritual awareness. She demonstrates this in Chapter 41, when she is the only one who can see the Hollow Num Chandelier, who is watching Orihime and her friends from the rooftop of her school. She doesn't want to alert the Hollow that she is aware of its presence. She just wants her friends to get to safety, so she initially acts like nothing is wrong. After she notices that the Hollow is no longer on the rooftop, it appears before them. It realizes that Orihime can see it. Desperately trying to tell her friends to run away, the Hollow attacks them. Num Chandelier fires seeds from its forehead, which penetrates into its victims. These seeds then sprout roots, allowing the Hollow to control the individual. Through this ability, the Hollow controls Orihime's classmates in order to attack her. While Orihime is being attacked, Tatsuki arrives in order to protect her. It is revealed that she too can see the Hollow, but only as a brief outline. At the end of chapter 41, Kubo draws a sketch which acts as a visual metaphor for the scenario that we have just read about. It is a sketch of a princess being protected by a fire-breathing dragon. We can of course see that the princess is Orihime, and the dragon represents Tatsuki. Or it could even represent Ichigo, who had fought to protect Orihime against Acid Wire. What this sketch symbolizes is Orihime's powerlessness. She in fact needs somebody to protect her because she has no power of her own. Tatsuki is easily defeated by the Hollow as Orihime rushes to her aid. It is here that we get a flashback which details how Orihime had been bullied in school because of the color of her hair. Up until enrolling into school, her brother had always described her hair as being beautiful because of its unique color. This had led to Orihime growing her hair out, but in school she had been bullied because of the color of her hair. She was harassed to the point that a student had grabbed a pair of scissors and started cutting her hair. After this incident, Orihime had decided to cut the rest so that it didn't look out of shape. She couldn't bring herself to tell her brother about what had happened, so instead she told him that she felt like having a change of hairstyle. It was not too long after this that her brother had passed away, and she had begun to feel lonely. She became quieter in school, and was no longer her cheerful self. That is, until she had met Tatsuki. She had picked Orihime up when she was down, and had protected her. It was thanks to Tatsuki being there for her that she was able to grow her hair out again. It is here that we learn that Orihime's long hair symbolizes the trust that she has in Tatsuki, and it is for this reason that she's never going to cut it short again. After Tatsuki is injured by the Hollow, Orihime resolves to protect her, and this is where the ability Shun Shun Rika, which stems from Orihime's hairpins, is activated. The end of this chapter is perfectly followed up by another sketch drawn by Kubo, which depicts a fallen dragon being protected by a princess. This symbolizes that the princess is no longer powerless. She can now protect her knight. Her ability Shun Shun Rika translates to six princess shielding flowers. Like the name suggests, she has six spirits which live within her hairpins. Through these spirits, Orihime is able to form multiple combinations, which grant her the powers to reject events that have taken place. She channels her abilities in order to attack, defend, or heal. This is the first time that her ability has been activated, so her spirits guide her in how to use it. These spirits reveal to Orihime that their job is to protect her. They are her power. They were awakened in response to Orihime's feelings of 
powerlessness. When the Hollow fires projectiles towards Orihime, she activates an ability called Santen Keshun. This is one of Orihime's signature defensive abilities, which repels an opponent's attack. It does so by forming a shield in front of her. This shield repels any form of negativity. Orihime then activates her healing ability called Soten Keshun in order to heal Tatsuki. And lastly, she uses the fairy called Subaki in order to activate an ability called Koten Zanshu, which attacks and defeats the hollow Num Chandelier in one strike. Activating her powers proves to be too much for Orihime, so she collapses. She is then picked up by Urahara and taken to a shop along with Chad. He explains to them the nature of hollows and Shinigami, but they don't seem to be convinced. So Urahara reminds them of the pain and the fear that they were feeling earlier when they encountered the hollows. He explains how Ichigo has high spiritual pressure and is a Shinigami. He can control his spiritual energy in order to defeat Hollows, and it is because of Ichigo's immense spiritual energy which has leaked from his body that it has affected the people around him. In the past, Orihime and Chad had encountered Ichigo in his Shinigami form several times, and it is because of this their latent abilities were activated. Urahara then takes both Orihime and Chad to where Ichigo is fighting. He allows them to have the choice whether if they will embrace their powers and to fight against Hollows, or return back to their ordinary lives. But in order to do that, Urahara Urahara has to prove to them that what he has said is true by introducing them to the world that they are about to step foot into and the enemy that they need to fight. While Orihime and Chad are watching Uryu and Ichigo fight against the Hollows, Orihime reveals that she didn't forget a single detail about her brother transforming into a Hollow. She had remembered how Ichigo had arrived to protect her. It is difficult for both Orihime and Chad to accept what is happening before them, to accept this new reality and to use their powers responsibly. After Rukia is taken back to the Soul Society by Renji and Byakuya, Orihime questions questions Ichigo as to why nobody else can remember Rukia. What you can note here is that Orihime waits for Ichigo in order to ask him this question. She can tell that he is troubled by something. When he reveals his plan to rescue Rukia after she was taken back to the Soul Society, Orihime supports him. But before she does, she reminds Ichigo that Rukia had come from the Soul Society in the first place. Everybody that she knows, including her friends and her family, are all from there. What will Ichigo do after he rescues her? Will he be comfortable with taking Rukia away from her loved ones? In a strange, out-of-character manner, Orihime questions whether if this is the right thing to do. Ichigo ponders on this question, but she interrupts him by saying of course it is the right thing, because she can tell that Ichigo has already made up his mind, and that is enough for Orihime to support him. Prior to Orihime speaking to him, Ichigo was thinking to himself how nothing had changed despite Rukia having left. Everybody was acting normal. It was like the world didn't notice Rukia's disappearance. He even starts to convince himself that this is because Rukia didn't belong here. Even having doubts whether if he should rescue her, he wonders if this is true, and it is Orihime who snaps him out of it and reminds him of his resolve to go and save her. Orihime wishing Ichigo good luck states that she doesn't want Rukia to die either. Orihime brings much needed clarity to Ichigo's mind here. After thanking her, he begins his training with Urahara, while Orihime speaks to Chad stating that she has made up her mind and she is going to assist Ichigo. It rained during the night that Ichigo was facing off against the Grand Fisher. During that battle, Orihime was with Tatsuki, who had told her about the circumstances behind the death of Ichigo's mother, and how losing his mother at such a fragile age had impacted impacted him greatly. He had often returned to the river where his mother had died. It was like he was looking for her. He had been walking around the river with a backpack on from morning till night. Tatsuki describes to Orihime how she couldn't stand to see Ichigo like this. In chapter 24, after Orihime leaves Tatsuki to return home, she thinks about how Ichigo must have felt after losing his mother at the age of nine. She recalls back to how she had felt after losing her brother, and how she knows the feeling of losing somebody that you're so attached to. Orihime knows that after losing a loved one, it makes you realize that nothing is for certain in this world. After learning about Ichigo's circumstance, she wonders if what she feels for Ichigo is kindness or one-sided sympathy. After knowing about Ichigo's past, she is able to understand him a little better. And I feel like this is key to understanding the bond between Orihime and Ichigo, how she is able to relate to how he feels, and she is able to sense when he is not being himself. Orihime may not know the significance of Rukia entering into Ichigo's world, how she was the one who had given him power. However, despite not knowing this, she is not willing to let Ichigo suffer that pain of loss again by allowing Rukia to be killed. After all, Rukia was an important part of his life, and she knows that Ichigo would not be able to forgive himself if anything happened to Rukia while he stood by and did nothing because the world didn't notice her disappearance. Orihime supports Ichigo's decision to rescue Rukia by beginning her own training under Yoriichi Shihoin. In chapter 62, we see Orihime activate her abilities after she remembers how she felt when she had wanted to protect Tatsuki from the Hollow. She goes through all of these links because she has a desire to get stronger also. After Ichigo leaves to train with Urahara, she she says to herself that she doesn't want Ichigo to get hurt, but she immediately snaps back and says that she won't let him get hurt. This is because Orihime is Ichigo's shield, and we are going to expand on this idea of Orihime being his shield as we progress through the video, and as we see Orihime's powers develop. The significance
evidence of Orihime's bond with Tatsuki is emphasized in chapter 68. Tatsuki realizes that she's going to be going away for a while and tells her not to go too far away, but Orihime reassures her. She thinks to herself that she is thankful for Tatsuki, but she doesn't want her to worry. It is because Tatsuki has always looked out for her that she feels safe no matter where she goes. Orihime promises to herself that no matter what happens in the Soul Society, she will return back to Tatsuki. Orihime, along with Uryu, Chad, Ichigo, and Yoriichi, travel to the Soul Society through the Dangai. One of her first actions after arriving into the Soul Society is to heal the gatekeeper Jidambo after Ginichimaru had injured him and prevented them from entering into the Serete. Orihime continues to demonstrate her feelings for Ichigo throughout the beginning of the Soul Society arc. When they arrive at the home of Kukakushiba and they are tasked to create Kido cannonballs, Ichigo struggles. She tries to reassure him and even in chapter 82 we see her sacrifice her own food just so that Ichigo can eat. When the group are fired out of Kukakushiba's cannon, they enter into the Serete. They all split up and Orihime ends up landing with Uryu. Despite her Sontenkashun ability breaking her fall, she ends up falling unconscious. And you'll notice whenever Orihime is sleeping or she's unconscious or daydreaming, she's always thinking about Ichigo or dreaming about him. She is eventually woken up by Uryu as they begin their mission to retrieve Rukia. In chapter 91, when the pair are confronted by a Shinigami, Orihime uses her abilities to summon Tsubaki to attack the enemy, but Tsubaki is easily defeated. An explanation for the weakness of this attack comes from the Shinigami who states that he has never seen an attack like that before, an attack which had no murderous intent behind it. And this is the first hint that we get, that an offensive style is not suited to Orihime's personality. Her enemy even tells her that she is not suited for the battlefield, she will not accomplish anything here without a murderous intent. This for me foreshadows how Urahara had told Orihime not to get involved with the war with Aizen during the Iranka arc, but I'll talk more about that when we get to discussing that portion of the story. But this is when Uryu arrives and protects Orihime. She is impressed by the results of his training. Uryu ends up defeating the Shinigami and the two of them disguise themselves with Shinigami uniform. However, their attempt to blend in with the other Shinigami is unsuccessful because unknown to them they are being followed by Mayuri Kurosochi, the captain of Squad 10. In chapter 121, Mayuri ends up using a group of Shinigami in order to detonate them in front of Uryu and Orihime, but Orihime generates a shield in order to protect the two of them. When Orihime had first activated their abilities, she had to call out a chant in order to summon the spirits, but Uryu recalls Orihime had been training in order to summon them without chanting. Her training was of course successful, explaining how she was able to quickly react to Mayuri's explosion by creating a shield. In the process of protecting herself and Uryu, Orihime had also protected another Shinigami, who is confused as to why Orihime is crying. He doesn't understand why she is crying for the dead Shinigami, and why on earth she had saved him. Mayuri becomes interested in Orihime's abilities, but Uryu demands that the Shinigami that she saved takes Orihime to safety. The two of them eventually get away while Uryu stays behind to battle against Mayuri. In chapter 128, Orihime and the Shinigami are found by the Lieutenant of the 11th Division, Yachiru. They are then taken to the Squad 11 headquarters for questioning. After this, Orihime has a very limited and brief involvement within this arc. We next see her in chapter 137, where she is travelling with Kimpachi Zaraki, as they are heading to the prison where Uryu, Chad, and Ganju are being held. After breaking them out, they travel to where Ichigo is battling against Byakuya, after Orihime identifies Ichigo's Ryatsu. In chapter 164, Orihime states that no matter how strong Ichigo's spiritual pressure gets, the scent of it is the same. She recognizes that the spiritual pressure that everybody can feel across the Serete can only belong to Ichigo. When Uryu says that Ichigo is risking his life to save Rukia, the Shinigami who is accompanying them asks them who is Rukia to them. Why is it that they are doing all of this just for a friend? But Orihime states that they are going through all of this effort because she means a lot to Ichigo. This is really insightful as Orihime states that Rukia had changed Ichigo's entire world. She is fully aware of what it meant to Ichigo for him to have gained the power to protect. She is well aware of the importance that Ichigo has for Rukia. In the same chapter when Ichigo and Byakuya's battle is getting heated, Uryu tells her to step back, but she tells him that she is going to stay right here where she can see Ichigo. Uryu thinks to himself that he knows that Orihime wants to help Ichigo, but if she does, she is only going to get in his way. At this stage, the way that Ichigo is, even if Orihime did go to help him, Ichigo wouldn't want that, and Orihime is well aware of this, but her feelings for Ichigo are so strong that she has to hold herself back from trying to assist Ichigo. So the only thing that Orihime can do right now is to wait. She's praying for him and believing that he's going to win. Uryu, who is well aware of how Orihime is feeling, tells Ichigo that he better not lose, otherwise he'll have to answer to him. And it is in this chapter where it is stated that Ichigo isn't willing to rely on his friends to fight by his side, which explains the conflict that Orihime must be feeling watching Ichigo battle on his own. But this only leads her to feeling inadequate, that she isn't strong enough to fight by his side. This point about not being strong enough to fight beside 
Ichigo is heavily discussed within the Iranka arc, and thankfully we do get a resolution to this plot thread at the end of the Thousand Year Blood War arc. But for now, Orihime continues to hold herself back and pray that Ichigo makes it out okay. In chapter 167, after Ichigo defeats Byakuya, Orihime expresses how she was worried for Ichigo. She apologizes to him that she couldn't protect him. She is appreciative that Ichigo didn't get himself hurt. She is grateful to the point of tears that Ichigo is okay. In response, he thanks her for her concern. You can see it's a very sincere moment between the two of them. Then in chapter 179, we see that Orihime is healing Ichigo. Orihime's abilities draws the attention of Unahana, who is surprised at how effective Orihime's healing abilities are. Her subordinates tell her that the only people that need healing are Byakuya and Ichigo, but Unahana states that Ichigo is in safe hands after witnessing Orihime healing him. I mean, you can infer that Orihime's abilities are just as effective as whatever Unahana would have done, and this is why she doesn't interfere with Orihime healing Ichigo. Orihime may not have the best offensive techniques, but she definitely makes up for this through her abilities to both defend and heal. At the end of chapter 181, after Rukia decides to stay within the Soul Society, the group leave to return to the world of the living. This then leads us to the Aranka arc, the longest arc of the series, and one where Orihime plays a very significant role, and we get to learn a lot more about her character. When they return back to their normal lives, Ichigo senses the presence of a hollow in chapter 183 and rushes off to deal with it. Orihime and Chad follow him, but he tells them that he could have handled the hollow on his own, and it wasn't necessary for them to come. He once again demonstrates his reluctance to work alongside his friends, but at this point, Orihime doesn't pay too much attention to it. She's just glad that she could have gotten out of class. But the next time that we see Orihime concerned is in chapter 189, after she notices that there is something off about Ichigo's mood. Along with Chad, she goes to confront Shinji, wondering if he knows the reason behind why Ichigo isn't being himself. After Hiyori threatens to kill them, but is taken away by Shinji, Orihime tries to run after them, but Chad tells her to forget it. This is because neither of them could catch up to Shinji and Hiyori because of their powers, and even if they did catch up to them, they wouldn't be strong enough to face off against them. This one exchange sums up the feelings of powerlessness that both Chad and Orihime feel during the Aranka arc. In chapter 191, we see that Chad and Orihime are among the first to arrive when Yami and Ukiora make their appearance in the world of the living. Chad tells Orihime to leave with Tatsuki, but she is forced to immediately return after witnessing Chad being easily taken down, thanks to Yami who severs his arm into two pieces. Prior to arriving at the scene, Chad had made Orihime promise him that no matter what happens to him, she will rescue all of the survivors and heal them. Orihime here realizes that Chad must have known that he wouldn't be strong enough to face off against the enemy. When Yami is about to attack her in chapter 192, Orihime demonstrates how much power she has when she is emotionally distressed. She summons a shield which protects herself from Yami's attack. It is here that Yami and Ukiora witness Orihime's healing abilities while she heals Chad's arm. Ukiora also refers to her abilities as a healing technique but then he corrects himself, stating that her powers appear to be manipulating space and time itself, concluding that healing would not be the best way to describe Orihime's powers. Her abilities are unlike anything that he has ever seen before. We can assume that it is at this moment that Ukiora decides to tell Aizen about her abilities. Meanwhile, Orihime decides to single-handedly face off against two of the most strongest opponents that we have seen up until this point. Her resolve is to buy enough time for Ichigo to get here, but she disagrees with herself, stating that she cannot always expect Ichigo to come to her rescue. You. Through her thoughts in this moment, we get to understand why Orihime acts and behaves the way that she does. She does not want to burden Ichigo, because right now there is something that is troubling him. She is unaware of the difficulty that he is having with his inner hollow, but she knows that he is going through something, and it is for this reason that she resolves not to trouble Ichigo, deciding to deal with Yami and Ukiora herself. Ichigo along with Tatsuki saved Orihime when she was younger after losing her brother. In their own unique ways, they helped her to move on from that pain and to continue her life, and in response, Orihime wants to do something for Ichigo in return. This is why she faces off against Yami and Ukiora in the hopes that this may be the only thing that she can do for him. Orihime launches an offensive attack by summoning Tsubaki and using the ability Koten Zanchu. While she launches this attack, she mentions how she's going to protect Tatsuki, Chad, Uryu, and Ichigo. You can see that in this way, she has a very similar desire to protect just like Ichigo does. But as we learned during the Soul Society arc, Orihime's strengths do not lie within her ability to attack. And this is why Yami easily destroys Tsubaki. After Orihime's ability 
abilities prove to not be strong enough, Ukiora gives Yami the order to kill her, and this is where the one that she was worried about so much arrives to protect her. Ichigo arrives just in time to stop Yami's attack, apologising to her that he took so long. In response, Orihime apologises to Ichigo that it is because of her weakness that both Chad and Tatsuki were injured, wishing that if she was only stronger, but Ichigo reassures her that it isn't her fault. After he activates his Bankai, determined to defeat the enemy. This is the first time that Orihime gets to see Ichigo's Bankai up close, but she notes that there is something about it that feels different from the time that she has seen it in Sokyoku Hill during the Soul Society arc. She describes that his spiritual pressure feels darker. The heavy fearsomeness of his energy is making it difficult for her to even breathe. It is like the person who is standing before her is not even Ichigo. Chapter 193, in my opinion, reveals a lot about the bond that Ichigo and Orihime share with each other. They both possess a shared desire to protect their loved ones, but there is a conflict that occurs, and this conflict is manifested within this chapter. To summarise it, it's Ichigo who feels like he's burdening himself with the responsibility of protecting everybody, and it's Orihime who desires to protect her loved ones and to fight alongside Ichigo, but the sad reality is that she isn't strong enough, and it upsets her that Ichigo even realises this. In chapter 193, after activating his Bankai, Ichigo tells Orihime to stand back, and you have a panel here which feels like Orihime's heart has been broken. You see it in the next panel that Kubo draws of Orihime's response through her eyes. It is like she is crushed. All she can do is stand back and pray, just like she was doing in the Soul Society arc. When I see this panel and I see the concern in her eyes like she's about to cry, and her holding her own hand as if she is holding herself back, these are very subtle details but they make you sympathise with her. Ichigo is doing well in the battle until his hollow tries to take over. He tries to suppress his hollow, rejecting its help, and it is here where he begins to lose the battle against Yami. After seeing Ichigo get hurt, she shouts out his name, rushing to help him, but he yells for her to stay back. Her inability to control herself and her desire to protect Ichigo results in her being attacked by Yami. If only Ichigo did rely on Orihime's abilities, she could have assisted him. She had proven prior that she could manifest a shield which could defend against Yami's attacks. If he had allowed Orihime to be the shield to his sword, then maybe the outcome wouldn't have ended like this, with Ichigo utterly defeated, resenting his inner hollow further. Their conflict with Yami and Ukiyora concludes after Yoriichi and Urahara arrive to assist them. After Yoriichi takes down Yami, she rushes to Orihime's aid, and it is here that we see the extent of injury that she has sustained after Yami's attack, with one side of her face being completely covered in blood. The anime adaptation of this moment is heavily censored. You don't get to appreciate the extent of injury that Orihime has sustained. Even when Yoriichi assists Orihime, all she is concerned about is whether if Ichigo is okay or not. Five days after the event, Orihime returns to school. She is greeted by Ichigo who looks visibly upset. It pains him to see Orihime bandaged up and hurt. The thing is, he is holding himself responsible for the fact that Orihime got hurt, because he wasn't strong enough. Even after the event, Orihime tries to reassure Ichigo, stating that she should have stayed back like he said, and it isn't his fault that she got hurt. Ichigo is of course disappointed with himself due to his inability to control his inner hollow and thus protect his loved ones, while Orihime is upset that she cannot help Ichigo to overcome whatever he is feeling. In chapter 196, Rukia drags Ichigo to apologise to Orihime. He promises to her that he'll get stronger, so that next time they won't be able to hurt her. Orihime is surprised, but then she thinks to herself that she is glad that Ichigo is back to his old self. Before they leave, Orihime thanks Rukia for helping Ichigo in his moment of need. In chapter 198, we get to appreciate just how human Orihime's character is portrayed to be. As usual, she is sharing the events of the day in her thoughts to the photo of her late brother, telling him that Ichigo had returned back to normal. While thinking about Rukia, she describes her as being amazing, to the extent that it is making her feel envious or jealous. These feelings are causing her conflict. She is upset that she's feeling like that about her friend Rukia. She doesn't want to feel jealous of her. She tried to assist Ichigo, but in the end it just made things worse. While Rukia made it look easy by saying the right things to Ichigo, so that he would stop feeling despair. In chapter 199, when Rangiku stays over at Orihime's, she notices that she is feeling upset. So she asks her why is it that she is so somber. She convinces Orihime to share with her how she is feeling, and like she had said previously, she describes how Rukia is amazing. She was easily able to cheer Ichigo up, despite the fact that he was upset for so long. This moment speaks volumes as to the person that Orihime is. Even when she is unintentionally feeling a certain way, she feels guilt and sadness. You can tell that she has no ill will towards anybody, and she doesn't enjoy hurting people even if they are her opponents or enemies. This is why she describes herself as a bad person to Rangiku. She had initially just wanted Ichigo to be happy, but now that Rukia is back and she easily cheered him up. She should be happy theoretically, but she cries in a vulnerability, stating that she is jealous of her. Rukia is kind, she's strong, she's so beautiful, and it is for those reasons that she loves her and has her as a friend. She appreciates the fact that she cheered up Ichigo, but why is it that she's feeling this way? When 
Orihime is at school, she doesn't feel like this. But when she returns home and is alone in the solitude of her own thoughts, these feelings of jealousy crop up. Orihime is so self-aware and reflective of her emotions and her actions. Rangiku embraces her, stating that she is silly for feeling this way because she has no reason to be jealous. She reassures her by saying that Ichigo is still very young. He can barely stand on his own. Right now, he needs both Orihime and Rukia to be there for him. She tells Orihime that jealousy isn't a bad thing. It's not like these feelings are intentional. The fact that Orihime is aware of how she is feeling and she's trying to deal with them, that is the biggest thing. She's not running away from her feelings. She is accepting that her feelings of jealousy exist and that they are there, but it is evident that she is not going to let them get the better of her. This exchange ends with Rangiku telling Orihime that she is a good person. When Grimjao and his Frashion attack, Orihime is kept away from the battle by Rangiku, who tells her to look after her Gigai. We then see her in chapter 213, where she is called upon to heal Rukia after Ichigo is unable to protect her from Grimjao. She watches Ichigo as he appears to be devastated. The concern on his face results in her also feeling upset for him. After all, she is able to relate to the powerlessness that Ichigo must be feeling. When Orihime learns about Aizen's plans from head captain Yamamoto, she is told to relay the information to the other humans. In chapter 224, Orihime demonstrates that she is able to track down Ichigo at the base of the Vizards. Despite the fact that it is shielded with a barrier, she is able to tell the properties on the makeup of the barrier in order to walk through it. The Vizards are surprised by how Orihime managed to bypass the barrier. Her incredible feat impresses the Vizard Hachigan who had created the barrier. Orihime was only able to bypass it because the barrier that Hachi had created was very similar to her Shunshun Rika ability. After Orihime tells Ichigo about Aizen's plans, he reassures her that he's going to stop Aizen. He's going to get stronger. After thanking Orihime, he gets back to training. Orihime realizes that Ichigo didn't have the time to process everything that she had told him because he is so preoccupied with his training and focused on getting stronger. But she knows that whatever Aizen is planning doesn't matter because Ichigo knows exactly what he has to do. He isn't afraid of Aizen. Orihime realizes that Ichigo is getting really strong, but she states that it isn't the same way as before, when the Hollow was interrupting his battle against Byakuya or even his battle against Yami. She knows that whatever Ichigo is going through, it may not be scary, but it isn't pleasant for him. He is struggling right now, and it is for this reason that Orihime decides that she's going to get stronger too. In chapter 226, Yoriichi approaches Orihime, stating that she was tasked by Urahara to find Orihime in order to bring her to his underground training room. After arriving, she asks Urahara what is it that he wanted to speak to her about. He describes how Rangiku had arrived earlier to speak to him. Urahara was made aware about the Oken and about how Aizen plans to sacrifice all of the people within Karakura Town in order to create it. He states that the Soul Society and everybody else has to prepare for an all-out war stating that a great deal of blood will be shed and that everybody will need to get stronger. This is why Orihime states that her resolve is to also get stronger, but Urahara tells her that Orihime won't be fighting with them this time. He says that Tsubaki was destroyed in battle by Yami the other day. He questions if he has been repaired. She replies that Tsubaki was broken so badly that she couldn't fix him and she doesn't know how to. Urahara rightfully says that Tsubaki is the only weapon that Orihime possesses. He cannot allow her to participate in the battle if Tsubaki is out of commission. Urahara's concern is that he doesn't want her to get killed. Chad argues with Urahara that Orihime's value is more important than fighting. This is because she can protect and heal people. But Urahara reminds Chad that with Captain Unohana and the 4th Division present, there won't be any need for Orihime to be in the battlefield. Urahara, who definitely could have said this in a more nicer tone, states that a warrior who cannot fight will only hold them back. It's a crushing blow for Orihime, who had already been questioning her worth on the battlefield. In this moment, she tries to conceal how she is feeling by thanking Urahara for just blunt telling her. She can understand where he is coming from. After saying goodbye, she runs away. She is constantly being told to stay back by Ichigo. She wasn't allowed to assist in the battle against Grimjao and his Frashion by Rangiku, and now Urahara tells her that she won't be needed on the battlefield. She is made to feel effectively useless when she desires to be anything but this. We do learn that Urahara had an alternative purpose for keeping Orihime away from the battlefield, which is so that Aizen isn't alerted to the remarkable abilities that Orihime possesses. But we learn that this is already too late, as in chapter 227, while he is replaying Ukiora's memories, he notices Orihime healing Chad, as he states that she appears to have interesting abilities. Urahara's concerns were correct, but it appears that he has acted too late on them, because Aizen has already set his sights on Orihime. The following chapter, 228, is very Orihime-centric, as immediately after leaving Urahara's place, she bumps into Rukia. After seeing her, she cannot help but to break down and start crying. After telling Rukia everything that Urahara had said, she states that she feels feels better after talking with her. After all, it's probably for the best if she isn't strong enough. But Rukia absolutely disagrees, stating that Orihime has done her own fair share of fighting up until 
until now. She had even gone to the Soul Society and fought. She isn't mad that she was dismissed by Urahara. Orihime is just sad that she can't fight alongside the rest of them. But more importantly than this, she doesn't want to be a burden to anybody. Remembering Urahara's words that she's only going to hold them back, she states that she definitely doesn't want to hold Ichigo back or anybody else. She'd rather be upset than to hold others back. But Rukia tells her that it isn't the people who are weak who cause problems on the battlefield. It is those who have a weak spirit. She states that during the Soul Society arc, Ichigo, Uryu, Chad, and even herself, none of them demonstrated a weak spirit. Because if any of them had, then Rukia would not be alive right now. Rukia reassures Orihime that there must be some use that Orihime may have in this battlefield, and that she's going to help her find it. This encouragement reassures her. And just as she starts to feel better, Hiyori arrives and states that the Vizard Hachi wants to speak to her. After analyzing her hair clips, he begins to understand that these are the source of Orihime's powers, describing the hair clips to be similar to Zanpakuto. He notices that one of the hair clips appears to be damaged. This had bothered Hachi the first time that Orihime had arrived to speak to Ichigo. Orihime of course reveals that she cannot fix it, that Tsubaki is broken, but then Hachi offers to fix Tsubaki for her, which surprises Orihime. Similar to us, the other Vizards are confused as to why Hachi is helping her, but they conclude that it's probably because Orihime has very similar abilities to Hachi. Orihime explains her predicament that Tsubaki was broken into so many pieces that she couldn't fix him, and it is for this reason that she was told that she cannot join the battle against Aizen. Hachi is surprised as he tells Orihime that she should have been able to fix Tsubaki, since she possesses a very similar ability to his own. This highlights that Orihime has a need to train and to practice her own abilities further. He tells her now that Tsubaki is fixed, she should have no trouble in joining the battlefield. But what Hachi says next is crucial to understanding Orihime and her abilities, and this is something that I think people do forget. He advises Orihime not to fight, saying that her abilities are not suited for combat, especially against the Arankas. He questions if she still wants to fight, to which Orihime replies that she does. He tells Orihime that she doesn't fully understand her abilities yet. There is a way for her to fight, but she must find it herself. After Orihime leaves the Vizard's base, she is greeted by Rukia. Rukia follows through with her offer to help Orihime by taking her to the Soul Society and training with her. Before Orihime leaves, she has an internal monologue, as she says that because she is so weak, she always turns to Ichigo. But this time, she says that she's not going to turn to him for help, promising that the next time that they see each other, she will be able to fight without looking at his back. And this is exactly like we have been saying from the beginning of this video. Orihime doesn't want to stand back and watch Ichigo fight for her. She wants to fight side by side with him. This totally destroys the notion that Orihime is some damsel in distress. Like I said previously, she wants to be the sword to his shield. While Orihime is training with Rukia, Aizen sets up a third invasion of the human world, while Ukiora is ordered to capture Orihime because her abilities have caught Aizen's attention. Ukitake alerts Rukia and Orihime while they are training about the third invasion of the Aranka. Rukia leaves while Orihime has to wait for the Dangai to be stabilized so that she can make a safe journey back. Everybody is surprised by the sudden appearance of the Aranka. They are unaware that this entire situation has been planned in order to kidnap Orihime. After training for a whole month in the Soul Society, Orihime returns. She is reassured that she has gotten strong enough to help now. While rushing through the Dangai, she tells Ichigo and everybody else to hold on as she is on her way. But it is here in the Dangai where Ukiora appears before her. He easily takes out the two Shinigami who accompanied Orihime. Orihime immediately begins to heal the two of them. This further reinforces Ukiora's resolve to take Orihime, as the injuries that he had left on the Shinigami were catastrophic. He is surprised that Orihime is even able to heal them, and it is for this reason that he tells her that she's going to come with him. He threatens her by saying that if she resists, then he's going to kill all of her friends. He gives her no choice. There's no room for discussion. She no longer has any rights. The only way that Orihime's friends can be saved is if she complies with her orders. Ukiora reveals that he is taking her because Aizen wants her powers. He has been ordered to bring Orihime back unharmed. We see Orihime again in chapter 237, as she is back in her home writing a farewell note to Rangiku and Hitsugaya. We found out that Ukiora had given Orihime a bracelet to her, which will conceal her presence, and the only people who will be able to see her are Aranka. This bracelet will also allow her to pass through solid objects. He tells her not to take it off, as he gives her 12 hours of mercy, saying that before she leaves, she has permission to say goodbye to one person. Orihime ends her note with the words, goodbye halcyon days. Halcyon meaning a period of time in the past which was an ideal and happy time to live in. As Orihime says goodbye to her peaceful days, she decides that Ichigo is the person that she wants to say farewell to. In one of the most memorable moments of the entire series, we see Orihime finally confess her true love for Ichigo. She attempts to kiss him but she can't do it. Before leaving, she expresses to him that if she were to have lived five different lives, then in 
all five of them, she would have fallen in love with the same guy. She thanks Ichigo and says goodbye before leaving for Huekamundo. By leaving, she feels that she is doing the right thing and that she is protecting her friends and Ichigo. She may have felt that she wasn't any use to Ichigo, rather more of a hindrance to him. But by doing this act, at least it will help Ichigo and in some way repay everything that he has done for her. When she arrives in Huekamundo, she is taken to Aizen's throne room in Los Noches. It is here where her powers are demonstrated as she heals the left arm of Grimjo. They say that her abilities go way beyond just simple healing. Aizen describes Orihime's abilities to be a rejection of phenomena. Her powers are able to reject and deny anything that has occurred to her affected subject. So in this instance, she can reverse the damage that was done to Grimjo by restoring his arm like it had never been destroyed. Aizen states that it is far more than just space or time manipulation. Her abilities step over the limitations that have been set by the gods, meaning that her powers violate the divine law. Orihime is introduced into the world of the Espada, as after healing Grimjow, he immediately kills Lupi, much to her surprise. Orihime is given her own room in Los Noches, but she wonders if she did the right thing by coming to Huekomundo. But she reassures herself, saying that she has to make them believe that she is useful for them, at least until her friends are ready for battle. In chapter 247, Ukiora informs her that her friends have arrived to rescue her. Orihime is surprised to learn about this news, but Ukiora states that it changes nothing because she is one of them now. In chapter 249, Ukiora recalls this moment, how we had sensed little to no hesitation from Orihime when he had told her that her heart now belongs to Aizen. Even he describes her as being incredibly brave. In chapter 249, Orihime is brought to Aizen. When they are left alone, he shows her the Hokyoku, the device that made it possible for him to turn hollows into Arankars, or to even conceive the thought of creating a Oken. He says that he has shown her the Hokyoku as a symbol of trust, and it is Orihime's abilities that he needs. He needs a power of rejecting phenomenon in order to assist him. When Orihime is taken back to her room, she thinks to herself that she doesn't believe that Aizen showed her the Hokyoku because he trusts her. There must be an alternative purpose for it, but at least now she knows where it is located. After coming to Huekomundo, now Orihime understands the nature of her abilities, which is the denial of events, the destruction of a phenomenon itself. She is grateful for the help that Ichigo and the others have come to rescue her, but she is not relying on it, as she is determined to make herself useful. She has figured out what she has to do in Huekomundo, and it is something that only she can do. She states that the phenomenon that she has to destroy is the Hokyoku. That will put a stop to Aizen's plans and to the suffering of her friends. After Chad is defeated, Ukiora arrives to speak to Orihime, questioning whether if he has sensed his defeat. But Orihime refuses to believe that Chad has died. But Ukiora says that it doesn't make any difference whether if he is alive or dead, because everybody who has come to rescue her will die eventually. He tries to make her feel despair by telling her that she must have known that this was coming. He describes her efforts to rescue her like lambs rushing to their slaughter. But this is where Orihime's attachment to her friends and her bravery shows once more as she slaps Ukiora for his comment. He is unfazed by this, but you can tell by Orihime's reactions that it took everything for her to try and hold herself back until she couldn't anymore. When he leaves, she is left distraught as she is clutching onto her chest, as if the pain or feeling that her friends have been hurt is too much for her to bear. In chapter 272, when Orihime is being assaulted by the pair of Arankas Loli and Menoli, Grimjo arrives putting a stop to their attack, considering that he owes her for healing his arm. He has arrived to take Orihime to heal Ichigo after he was defeated by Ukiora. But before leaving, he tells her to heal herself. But instead, Orihime heals the Arankars that Grimjao had dispatched. The very Arankars that were beating up Orihime not too long ago. Her act of kindness after they were so cruel to her leaves the Arankars shocked. Loli even goes as far as to describing her as a monster. But this is just the person that Orihime is. She doesn't hold grudges. It is difficult for her to even have ill will towards people who have wronged her. In chapter 277, when Grimjao brings her to the lifeless body of Ichigo, Orihime is shocked. Grimjao orders her to heal him. Orihime does have difficulty healing Ichigo's wounds as a tremendous amount of spiritual pressure is swirling around it. She's finding it difficult to reject Ukiora's residual spiritual pressure. Eventually, she is able to break through the Riatsu and to begin healing Ichigo as he starts to show signs of life. They are incredibly relieved to know that he is okay. But Orihime is surprised to learn that Grimjao only wants her to heal Ichigo so that he can kill him. Ukiora disrupts their plans as he demands that Orihime is returned to him. His presence is making Orihime feel very nervous. That is until Grimjao has a brief battle with him and uses his ability Kaja Negation, sealing him into a closed dimension. He says that this has brought them about two or three hours of time. He now demands that Orihime heals Ichigo, but she refuses to. She's not going to assist Grimjao in killing Ichigo. She only does so after Ichigo tells her to heal him. She even ends up healing Grimjao at Ichigo's request. This is the first time that Ichigo and Orihime have been on the battlefield together since the arrival of Ukiara and Yami at the beginning of the Arankar arc. Ichigo reassures her 
that he's going to win, but Orihime looks on desperately as she sees once again the back of Ichigo. She had promised that she was going to fight by his side, but just like several times before, she is told to step back and watch Ichigo fight alone. At the beginning of their battle, Nell is nervous and upset and worried about Ichigo, but Orihime reassures her, reminding her that Ichigo said that he'd win. He promised them, so he will win. She tells Nell that they need to have faith in him and wait, but as she says this, she is clenching her fist. It's a subtle detail that's very easy to miss, and it highlights that Orihime's feelings for Ichigo are making it difficult for her to just stand by and do nothing. In chapter 280, Grimjow fires a Grand Ray Saro towards the direction of Orihime and Nell, but this is when Ichigo activates his hollow mask and rushes to protect them. Orihime immediately senses the change in Ichigo and it's making her heart beat faster and louder. With his hollow mask donned, Ichigo turns around to look at Orihime, but she sees somebody completely different. It is like she is looking at a monster. Ichigo notices that his appearance is disturbing Orihime, but he reassures her not to worry because he's going to end the battle quickly. But his words don't reassure Orihime in the slightest as she is still concerned. When Ichigo once again arrives to protect Orihime from one of Grimjao's attacks, they have an opportunity to look into each other's eyes. She looks on in complete shock and fear. An emphasis is placed upon the eyes of Ichigo, how the whites of his eyes have turned black. This once again makes her heart beat louder. In chapter 283, we get an insight from Orihime as she tells herself that she can't be afraid of Ichigo, but when she thinks back to the eyes that she had seen, she feels like Ichigo is turning into something or someone that she doesn't know. She can't see her own reflection in his eyes, and it reminds her of the monster that her brother had turned into right at the beginning of the series. This is an excellent parallel that Kubo draws attention to during this moment. Orihime has been through this before. At this moment, Nell is confused as to how Ichigo is losing despite the fact that he has donned his hollow mask. Previously, it was like he was invincible when he had won it, but now he is getting beaten. It is Nell who notices the conflict within Orihime, and she encourages her to cheer Ichigo on, asking her what is she afraid of? Wasn't it Orihime who said that Ichigo was a good person? Ichigo too cares for Orihime a great deal, and she explains this to her, stating that he only attacked Ukiara after learning that he was the one who brought Orihime to Huekomundo. Nell rightfully says that Ichigo is still a human being. He didn't become a Shinigami or put that hollow mask on because he wanted to. It's because because he is fighting for his loved ones and he is in pain right now. He is using that power, fighting and bleeding so that he can rescue Orihime. She asks her if Orihime won't cheer him on, then who else will? In this moment, Orihime thinks that she is right. Similar to Ichigo, Orihime had that desire to protect her friends. That is the reason why she came to Huekomundo. She had tried to be brave, but after Ukiora had told her that her friends had come to save her, she felt glad. But Orihime felt conflicted when she had seen Ichigo wearing that hollow mask. She wasn't entirely sure if Ichigo really came to rescue her, but after hearing Nell, she feels reassured. And despite all of this, it shouldn't matter. The fact of the matter is, Ichigo is fighting right now for her. He is enduring all of this pain for her sake, and it is here that Ichigo gets the encouragement that he so desperately needed, as she tells him not to die. With tears rolling down her face, she tells him that he doesn't have to win. He doesn't have to keep trying so hard. She just doesn't want him to get hurt anymore. Orihime is very self-aware of the fact that she is always relying on Ichigo to protect her. She had become fearful of Ichigo after noticing that he was becoming a monster in order to fulfill this purpose. In order to fight and to gain the strength to protect his loved ones, Ichigo was enduring a great deal of pain. She had come to the realization that the person she loved was forcing to hurt himself because she was not strong enough to protect him. Orihime could do nothing to protect Ichigo from this pain that he was enduring. She couldn't protect him from becoming a monster, and this fear of Ichigo becoming a monster is actualized during his battle against Ukiora. In chapter 313, Orihime is once again kidnapped by Stark, who takes a in front of Aizen, who tells her that he is going to leave now to destroy Karakura Town, revealing that the plan to kidnap her was a diversion, so that the Shinigami would be lured to Huekomundo, thus having fewer numbers to counterattack Aizen in Karakura Town. Ukiara is also revealed to have returned in chapter 315 and is guarding Orihime. He attempts to make her feel despair by questioning if she is afraid. Now that Aizen doesn't want her anymore, she's going to die here, alone with nobody by her side. Ukiara wants to know if this frightens her, but Orihime says that she isn't afraid because her friends will come and rescue her, because her heart is already with them. When Orihime had first heard that they had come to save her, she felt happy, but at the same time she was upset. She had come to Huekomundo so that they wouldn't get 
hurt. So she is questioning why is it that they've gotten themselves in harm's way? Did they not know that Orihime was trying to keep them safe? But after Orihime had sensed all of her friends fighting, and even some of them collapsing after battling, she realized that she was wrong. She wanted all of her friends to be safe. She came to the realization that her friends must be feeling the same way about her. Because if any one of her friends had disappeared like she did, then she knows that she would go looking for them. Orihime speaks to Ukiora about how six hearts can beat as one, describing what it feels to care about others, and to have your heart in sync with theirs. This is where Ukiora becomes very confused about the concept of the heart, and I go into a lot of discussion about this in my Ukiora character analysis video, and there I give his perspective on this conversation, as well as how Orihime ultimately teaches Ukiora what it means to have a heart. So definitely check out the Ukiora character analysis video if you want his perspective on these different interactions that he has with Orihime. In chapter 341, Ukiora is about to land a fatal blow to Ichigo, that is until Orihime saves him with her Santan Keshun. Prior to doing this, Orihime was looking on nervously. She was hesitating and Ukiora comments on this in chapter 342, questioning why is it that she didn't protect Ichigo from the first strike that Ukiora landed on him? Why is it that she hesitated? But Ichigo interrupts, saying that it doesn't matter and he thanks Orihime for assisting him, but he then advises her to take cover because it's dangerous here. In other words, saying that he doesn't need her help. She is concerned and worried for him, but once again must conceal how she is feeling. She can't help him so she listens to Ichigo and takes cover, but this is where she is ambushed by the two Orang cars from earlier, Lolly and Minoli. They start to torture her and to rip off her clothes. Ichigo tries to help her but Ukiora keeps getting in his way, but when Yami arrives, he easily defeats the two Orang cars. After killing them, he turns his attention to Orihime, asking Ukiora if he can kill her, but then Uryu comes to her aid, sending the oversized Orang car crashing down the tower. As the battle between Ichigo and Ukiora continues, he tells Uryu to protect Orihime with his life. When Ukiora breaks through the Dome of Las Noches and activates his resurrection, you can see the concern in the eyes of Orihime. In chapter 346, we get a callback to the Soul Society arc, similarly how Orihime and Uryu were observing Ichigo battling against Byakuya. Uryu once again notes the concern on Orihime's face. In chapter 164, if you remember, he had told her to step back, but after hearing her resolve to stay and watch Ichigo, he realizes that Orihime is waiting and praying that that he'll win. So in chapter 346, instead of asking if she is okay, he reassures her by telling her that Ichigo will win. Similarly, he thinks to himself that Ichigo better not lose. Uryu's confidence in Ichigo at least gives Orihime a faint smile on her face, unlike in chapter 164, where after speaking to her, she still looked on in concern. And this is just one of the many parallels that exist between the Iranka arc and the Soul Society arc. You could tell how the placement of characters is intentional, as the responses are completely the opposite of the response that occurred previously. The situations may be similar between the two arcs, but the outcomes are entirely different. And it's the same case when you compare the rescue of Orihime to the rescue of Rukia. Rukia was forced to go to the Soul Society, she had no choice in the matter. The end goal was to rescue Rukia from being executed. Whereas in the Huekomundo arc, Orihime wanted to be useful, so she had willingly left to go to Huekomundo in order to protect her friends. While in Los Noches, she devised a way to disrupt Aizen's plans by using her powers to destroy the Hokyoku. Orihime Hime wasn't relying on her friends to rescue her, whereas in the Soul Society arc, Rukia was concealing her feelings. Deep down, she was relying on them to come. Orihime had tried to shoulder the burden of protecting everybody, but then realized that all of her friends feel the same way about each other. They want to protect and help each other. Rukia was accepting the fact that she was going to die. She only had hope after realizing that Ichigo and the others had invaded into the Serete. And the last point that I really have to say about how saving Rukia was different to saving Orihime is that the entire Soul Society arc was based around this idea idea of rescuing Rukia, whereas rescuing Orihime was a smaller plot thread, which got Ichigo and the others to go to Huekomundo just as Aizen had planned. The entire point of the Aranka arc wasn't to rescue Orihime, it was to put a stop to Aizen's plans, and it just so happened that Orihime got caught up with his plans, and he had used it as a tool to manipulate Ichigo and the Soul Society. I speak more about how the Huekomundo arc is an inversion of the Soul Society arc during my The Rise of Bleach video, so check that out if you want to learn more about how these two arcs are very different to each other. Despite Despite having similarities. Orihime pleads with Uryu to take her above the canopy so that they can see what is going on. She arrives to witness Ukiora holding Ichigo's lifeless body with his tail. She then looks on in horror as Ukiora tells her that the man that she put all of her hopes on is about to die. He fires a Cerro Oscuras at point black range through Ichigo's chest. We have a rare moment in chapter 349 where we see Orihime's character completely panic and lose composure. Uryu distracts Ukiora, giving Orihime enough time to try and attempt to heal Ichigo. 
Ichigo. While healing him, she asks herself what should she do? We get an internal monologue here, where she says that deep down inside, she had always thought if Ichigo was around, everything would be okay. She was reassured that Ichigo would always win, but in this moment where it appears that Ichigo has lost, she admits that she was blinded by the faith that she had in him. Repeatedly asking her what should she do, she loses all composure. The situation is frankly looking bleak, as Ichigo isn't responding to her healing, and Uryu, who is vastly outmatched by Ukiora, is thrown across the battlefield and has had his left hand severed. Trying to heal Ichigo, she doesn't know what to do. In her desperation, she repeatedly calls out for Ichigo to help her. Her plea for help causes the inner hollow within Ichigo to manifest. Ichigo's holified body begins to defend Orihime and Uryu. In a moment of hopelessness, he once again arrives to protect her. But like I mentioned before, her reliance on Ichigo to protect her has resulted in him becoming a monster. The fear that she had during the battle between Ichigo versus Grimja has been actualized. And why did this ultimately happen? Because Orihime wasn't strong enough to fight by his side and to protect him from the pain that he was going through by continually fighting to get stronger. After witnessing the immense power of this transformation, both Uryu and Orihime are concerned for Ichigo. They witness him easily defeat Ukiora. When Ichigo's vast lord form attacks Uryu, Orihime then blames herself, stating that it is her fault. It is because she called out for Ichigo to help her. She is almost frustrated with herself as she says that she trained so that this wouldn't happen. She had come to Wake on Window to protect Ichigo. So why is it that it has turned out to be like this? That she is relying on Ichigo? This one internal monologue summarizes Orihime's motives for action during the Hueco Mundo arc. We know that Ukiora ultimately puts a stop to Ichigo's inner hollow by breaking one of its horns, thus restoring Ichigo back to normal. After Ichigo returns to normal and his chest is healed, Orihime is incredibly relieved. Before dying, Ukiora asks Orihime if she is afraid of him. She says that she isn't as she reaches out for his hand. But before they can touch, Ukiora's hand fades away, as it appears that through his interactions with Orihime, Ukiora has come to understand what it means to have a heart and to no longer feel alone. Her bravery to come to Huekomundo and the faith that she continuously had in her friends ultimately impacted Ukiora's character, leaving a lasting impression on him. After the battle with Ukiora, Orihime stays to heal Uryu's wounds. We see her again in chapter 422. After Aizen's defeat, she is relieved to see that Ichigo is okay. One month after this, she is in Ichigo's room with Rukia, Uryu, and Chad. She is present as Ichigo says farewell to Rukia. This now leads us to Orihime's involvement within the Forbring arc. She introduces herself into this arc in chapter 425, where we see that she still has the same bubbly personality, but a very different appearance thanks to her new hairstyle. In chapter 427, Orihime says that the past few days she has been feeling something strange about Ichigo. These concerns are generally dismissed as she rushes off home for work. In chapter 427, she arrives at Kurosaki Clinic to offer Ichigo some leftover bread from work. While in his company, she takes the opportunity to to express her concerns to him, asking if something has happened to him recently. He says that nothing out of the ordinary has been going on. She just thought that maybe he was being followed by someone or that he was in trouble. Ichigo continues to deny that nothing is going on, despite the fact that his hand had twitched once Orihime had asked him that question. But Orihime feels bad for jumping to conclusions and getting worried for no reason. But Ichigo does admit that he is glad that Orihime does this. In chapter 430, after returning home, she admits that Ichigo is hiding something. It's a subtle detail that Kubo draws, but she'd noticed that Ichigo's hand twitched when she had asked him if something had happened or if someone was following him. Later, she visits Uryu in Karakura Hospital after hearing that he has been attacked. In chapter 430, she sees the visible concern on Ichigo's face. After Uryu refuses to tell him anything about his attacker, Ichigo's feelings of powerlessness are further emphasized. When Ichigo offers to walk Orihime home, Ryuken then states that he will take Orihime back. When Ichigo leaves, Ryuken reveals to Orihime that it appears that Ichigo won't be of much help since he doesn't have any powers. He tells Orihime that Uryu wasn't attacked by a hollow, nor a Shinigami. The residual spiritual pressure left in Uryu's wounds led to Ryuken concluding that he was attacked by something that he has never come across before. He relays everything that he knows to Orihime, and admits that Uryu himself doesn't even know what attacked him, and it is for this reason that he didn't want to talk to Orihime or Ichigo about the attack, as he didn't know what to say. He describes their enemy as being human, but they are not Shinigami. Their powers are similar to Orihime and Chad's. Ryuken explains to Orihime that the next person who may be be attacked is either Orihime or Chad. After this explanation, he takes her home. After getting concerned for Chad that he has been missing for a few days and hasn't been attending school, she visits his home and leaves some 
bread for him, hoping that he feels better and returns to school soon. In chapter 438, Orihime is confronted by Tsukishima and his subordinate. Tsukishima admits that he was the one who attacked Uryu. Orihime notices that Tsukishima's bookmark has turned into a sword. She fears that Tsukishima is going to attack his subordinate and she gets in the way, protecting him. Orihime bravely states that if Tsukishima did indeed attack Uryu, then she cannot let him leave. Orihime is attacked by Tsukishima. Chad and Ichigo, who had sensed a disturbance in her spiritual pressure, quickly arrive to her aid, but she's confused. Despite the fact that Tsukishima had cut her, she is left with no wound. She had definitely felt the blade pierce her body, but there was no evidence of it. Despite that concern, Orihime reassures both Ichigo and Chad that nothing had happened. Momentarily, she even describes Tsukishima as being a friend. She is confused as to why she referred to Tsukishima as a friend, despite the fact that she knows that he attacked Uryu. Orihime in chapter 440 says that she cannot tell Ichigo what had happened to her, but she says that she's going to text Chad later about the events. Orihime doesn't know that Ichigo is about to regain his powers, and after everything that had happened in the past, she doesn't want to drag Ichigo into another fight because of her. And most of all, she doesn't want Ichigo to know that she is in danger. And it is for this reason that Chad goes along with Orihime's lie, and reassures Ichigo that nothing is going on. Chad agrees that it is too early to involve Ichigo into a fight. In chapter 442, she relays everything that had happened to her to Chad. She admits to him that momentarily it felt like her memories were being altered by Tsukishima's abilities. In chapter 448, Riruka arrives in front of Orihime, requesting her help to assist Ichigo with his training. Orihime had come to terms with this a long time ago that if Ichigo needs her help for something, then she will help him no matter what, even if it means that he's going to get hurt and he needs her help to heal him. If it's for the sake of him getting stronger, then she's going to help. Riruka taunts Orihime, questioning what would happen if Ichigo ended up hurting himself beyond repair. But Orihime adamantly says that she will not let that happen. No matter how bad his injuries are, she is going to heal all of them. In chapter 449, Orihime arrives in Yukio's Fullbring. Her attention is brought towards a heavily injured Ichigo. She immediately rushes over to heal him. Ichigo didn't want to drag Orihime into this, but Chad says that he's going to need her help if he wants to get stronger. Ginjo starts to get impatient with Orihime's healing, asking how long is it going to take. She says that she needs a little bit more time, but Ginjo says that he cannot wait. Ichigo says that he is good to go but Orihime says that she isn't finished healing. Ginjo ignores Orihime's warnings and rushes towards them to attack. This is when Orihime uses a new ability called Shiten Koshun to protect the two of them. When Ginjo attacks the barrier, it attacks back. Orihime states that this shield is different because it diffuses the impact of an attack by exploding at the very moment the shield is hit. This causes the shield to respond by reflecting the attack back to Ginjo. For the first time, Orihime uses her powers to protect Ichigo as she warns Ginjo not to attack until she says so. Ichigo is surprised as she questions when did she get so strong. But Orihime tells Ichigo that Chad and Orihime were not doing nothing for the 17 months since he had lost his powers. They continue to have faith that Ichigo would one day regain his powers, so they had decided that they would get stronger, both her and Chad. Once Ichigo had regained their powers, they are not going to hold him back. They don't want Ichigo to worry about them. They want him to focus on regaining his abilities. And once he has them back, they are hoping to fight alongside him and not just rely on Ichigo to protect them. Ichigo realizes this and thanks Orihime. You can see that she is really glad that he understands their resolve and their reason for getting stronger. In chapter 450, Ruruka and Orihime sit down with each other. She shares her donuts with her after Orihime had desperately been looking at them. After questioning her, she learns that Orihime had a very difficult childhood. Outwardly, Ruruka is very abrupt, but you can tell from her facial expressions that she has a lot of sympathy for Orihime. She questions her how is it that she can talk about things that have happened to her so frankly with a smile on her face like her abusive parents or how her brother had died when she was young and the fact that she is living alone now. Orihime says that she can talk about these things so easily because she has already been saved. It is thanks to Ichigo that she can smile. Ruruka abruptly leaves but tells her that she can eat the rest of her donuts. Orihime is able to understand the subtle complexities of Ruruka's behavior and thanks her, coming to the conclusion that Ruruka is a nice person after all. When Ichigo's eyes are cut by Ginjo, Orihime rushes towards him, trying to heal him, but he stops her. He tells Orihime that Ichigo had lost his resolve to fight after he had lost his Shinigami powers, and he is helping him to get this back. Orihime, who can no longer watch Ichigo getting beaten by Ginjo, tries to assist him. That is until Yukio places her into a cage. After Ichigo finally attains his fullbring, she leaves Yukio's fullbring along with Ichigo and Chad. In chapter 455, when Ichigo arrives at Tsukushima's mansion and discovers that all of his friends and family members' memories have been altered by him, he attempts to attack Tsukushima. Ichigo is shocked to see Chad and Orihime arrive, protecting Tsukushima. 
Orihime ends up healing Tsukushima's arm. She asks Ichigo if he has forgotten everything that Tsukushima has done for them, including saving Rukia and defeating Aizen. Orihime continues to protect Tsukushima, and we see her again in chapter 462. Orihime appears to be devastated in this chapter after realizing that Ichigo was crying. Her feelings for Ichigo are so strong that they lead her to feeling confused. Why is it that despite the fact that she has so many memories of Tsukushima, why is it that she is getting upset when she sees Ichigo crying? Why is it that she feels so much pain? She rushes towards Ichigo telling him not to cry anymore. You can see the relief on her face when she sees that Ichigo is completely okay now and has regained his Shinigami powers. Tsukushima once again tries to alter the memories of both Orihime and Chad after they begin to realize that all of the Shinigami have arrived to stop Ginjo. Before they start to lose their minds completely, Urahara and Ishin arrive to save them. They knock them out and take them to Urahara shop. Once Tsukushima is defeated, their condition becomes stable. In chapter 478, Orihime wakes up alongside Ruruka. She expresses that they are glad that they found her, as it appears that the other four bringers were not able to be recovered. She starts crying at the fact that Ruruka is still alive. After Ruruka learns that Tsukushima has been killed, she begins to cry. The two of them end up crying together as the Forbring arc wraps up, and Orihime's kindness has once again left an impression on another character. During the Thousand Year Budwa arc, Orihime accompanies Ichigo, Chad, Urahara, and Nell back to Huekomundo to investigate what is going on. They discover that the Arankars are being attacked by the Quincy. They discover a large number of dead Arankar. Ichigo ends up fighting one of the Stenritters called Kilge Opi. Urahara eventually intervenes and battles the Stenritter while Ichigo rushes off to the Soul Society. Orihime, Chad, and Urahara remain within Huekomundo while most of the action of the first half of this arc occurs in the Soul Society. We don't see Orihime again until chapter 518, after the conclusion of the first Quincy invasion. Urahara reassures Ichigo that Orihime and Chad are safe. Sometime after this, we see Orihime traveling across Weko Mundo's deserts. She arrives at the Nigal ruins. She is greeted by Chad as she discovers that everybody is there, including Urahara. It appears that Urahara has been studying the medallion left by Kilge Opi. In chapter 546, we see Orihime training for the second Quincy invasion. Orihime recalls how peaceful it is here in Hueco Mundo, but Chad reminds her that they are training for a battle. Orihime notes that it is strange for humans to be in Hueco Mundo helping the Arankars. They are all working together for the sake of the Soul Society. Orihime likes that everybody has put aside their differences for this one common goal to defeat the Quincy. She wishes that this peace that she is feeling right now could last forever. Everybody helping and respecting one another. She says that if only people helped each other and respected each other's wills, then maybe these battles would have never started. Orihime arrives in the Soul Society along with Chad in chapter 586 as she protects Ichigo from one of Uryu's attacks. She is surprised to see that Uryu has now sided with the enemy. Both Chad and Orihime arrive to calm Ichigo down after he is angered by Uryu's betrayal. It upsets her to see Ichigo affected by Uryu's actions. After Chad snaps some sense into Ichigo, Orihime agrees with both Ichigo and Chad that they are going to bring Uryu back even by force if they have to. Urahara then interrupts them as he offers to take them all to the Soul King's palace. He takes them to the basement of the 12th Division, where Mayuri has created a replica of Kukakushiba's cannon. In chapter 598, they are fired into the Soul King's palace from the cannon. Orihime recalls how this reminds her of when they went to rescue Rukia and how Uryu was with them at that time. Orihime wonders if he will come back to them, but Ichigo reassures her that of course he will. They are going to take down Yuhobak, and at the same time they are going to drag Uryu back, smacking some sense into him. Ichigo's confidence brings a smile to Orihime's face. In chapter 613, Orihime and the others arrive at the main palace of the Soul King. It is here that they confront Yuhobak. After the Soul King is severed into two pieces, Orihime attempts to heal him, but her Sotan Kishun breaks. Yuhobak calls her foolish, stating that a human's abilities are not enough to bring the Soul King back to life. It is impossible. After an unsuccessful confrontation, Orihime and the others are thrown out of the Soul King's palace as they fall down to the Serite below in chapter 620. Orihime and the others return for a counterattack thanks to Yukio's modified Valley of Screams. They discover that the Quincy have transformed the Soul King's palace into their own haven called Waharwald. Orihime, Chad, and Ichigo rush towards Yuhobak's location. Arriving, they discover Uryu battling against Hashwald. In chapter 660, Uryu reveals his true intentions, which were to destroy Waharwald and to defeat Yuhobak. He tells Ichigo, Chad, and Orihime to go to the top of Waharwald to kill Yuhobak. Orihime is incredibly relieved to know that Uryu is still on their side and hasn't betrayed them. In chapter 661, we learn that Orihime had never believed that Uryu would betray them. This is why she feels so reassured to the point of tears that he hasn't. Chad ends up staying behind to battle against Quincy statues, while Ichigo and Orihime rush towards Yuhobak's throne room. 
In chapter 672, they finally climb up the steps arriving at the throne room. They both can feel Yuhobak's immense spiritual pressure behind the gate. It is here that a significant character-defining moment occurs for Orihime. As we see the end of her story arc, Ichigo tells her that it may be unfair if they battle two against one, so he puts her in charge of defense, telling her that he is counting on her. It is in this moment that Ichigo stops telling her to stand back and to get to safety. Just as Orihime had been relying on him, he is now relying on her. Just as we have been talking about throughout the entirety of this video, Orihime says it herself, finally, thinking back to the battle between Ichigo and Byakuya, how she had wanted to help. Even during the battle between Ichigo and Grimjao, has she desired to assist him? She has finally gained the acceptance that she was seeking. She can now finally fight to protect Ichigo, just as Ichigo has been fighting to protect her. The sword and the shield have finally become one. Together, they walk into Yuhobak's palace. Yuhobak attacks Ichigo with a dark spiritual energy, but Orihime blocks it using one of her shields. Orihime continues to heal Ichigo's wounds as he continuously strikes Yuhobak. When Yuhobak strikes towards Ichigo in chapter 675, he calls out to her and she summons a shield to protect them. Orihime admits in this moment that she was struggling to keep up with Ichigo. She could barely hold on to him to tell him to wait, but when Ichigo had slowed down and looked back at her face, she felt that Ichigo had a plan. She didn't see the face of somebody who had given up hope. She had seen Ichigo confident and determined to execute his plan to defeat the opponent. In chapter 675, Ichigo undergoes a transformation as his sword turns white. Orihime recalls the vast Alode transformation as she looks on in shock. She witnesses Ichigo's hollow transformation in chapter 676, but she is reassured that Ichigo is still himself. Ichigo tells her not to worry, recognizing that she is concerned. Ichigo then tells her to protect herself from his Ryatsu. By spreading out her shield, a large explosion erupts as Ichigo charges towards Yuhabak. In chapter 678, Yuhabak begins to overpower Ichigo. When she summons a shield to protect Ichigo from one of his attacks, Yuhabak cuts through it as if the shield wasn't there. Orihime is shocked to know that her defensive ability didn't work. After Ichigo and Orihime are made to feel despair at the sheer power of Yuhobak. He knocks the two of them unconscious and leaves. Later, Rukia and Renji arrive to assist Orihime and Ichigo. As Orihime tells Rukia about Yuhobak's power, she is disappointed in herself that she wasn't able to fix Ichigo's Zanpakuto, as her ability to reject cannot fix something that's been broken in the coming future. Orihime apologizes to Ichigo that he can no longer fight. But once Tsukishima arrives and uses his ability Book of End on Ichigo, she is able to restore Ichigo's Tensor Zangetsu to his original state. And with this, Ichigo is now able to challenge Yuhabak once more. We don't see Orihime again really in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, but we do see her in the epilogue of the series. In chapter 686, 10 years after the defeat of Yuhabak, we learn that Orihime has married Ichigo, and they have a son called Kazui Kurosaki. We also learn that she is still able to use all of her abilities, as she is using one of her spirits, Tsubaki, to keep an eye on Kazui. Orihime's constant faith in Ichigo supported him throughout the entirety of the series. Despite having a difficult past, she was able to manage manifest an ability which defies even the gods. When reality gets too much for her, she can reject it. Ichigo may have left a lasting impression on her and made it so that she could talk about the difficult things in her life with a smile, but she too has left a lasting impression on so many characters, including one of the most cruel and cold-blooded villains, Ukiora. She was able to make him feel what it means to have a heart, just as her powers have continued to grow from each successive story arc. She too as a character has continued to grow from the shy and timid girl that we saw right at the beginning of the story. As an empowered character, she was able to fight side by side with the protagonist, her desire finally fulfilled. Despite the ending of the Thousand Year Blood War arc being rushed, this is one aspect of it which I always loved. I loved how Kubo concluded each fear that Orihime had. The first of which was a fear of never fighting alongside Ichigo, and always seeing his back, while she stayed back doing nothing. And the second being the fear that Ichigo would lose himself to his hollow. Both of these fears were resolved. In the end, Orihime ended up getting the life that she wanted, a life where she will never have to say goodbye bye to those halcyon days. I think this is a good spot to end this video on Orihime Inoue. And to now hand over the discussion to all of you. What did you think about Orihime's character? Did you learn or pick up on any small details about Orihime's character that you didn't notice in the past? I would love to read your thoughts and your comments on Orihime. Now leading up to the Ichigo character analysis video, the next video that I'm going to be uploading is on our favorite Quincy, Uryu Ishida. So definitely subscribe and turn on the bell notification so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, then please consider supporting my channel on Patreon. I have multiple tiers with the rewards including access to an exclusive Discord server, video scripts, as well as being the first to know about unreleased upcoming videos. Thank you for your time and whatever you choose to contribute, I will appreciate and it will mean a lot to me.